。好的，好的。啊，可以了，可以了。All good, thank you. Sorry for joining up too late. All good, all good. So, uh, maybe we can just start. Sounds yeah. good. Okay. Yeah. Cool, cool. So, um, good afternoon and evening, everyone. My name is Yama, and welcome to Crypto Tonight, uh, NFT Gaming episode. This episode is going to be fun. So, people love to play these days. Uh, play to earn, like I see, or play to date. Um. Uh, Maybe like Tinder, <laughs> joking. So, but really, uh, the vision of combining the gaming, NFT, and DeFi together is extremely exciting. So, to start with, please join me welcoming our four fantastic guests tonight, and they are Alexander, the co-founder of RC Infinity. Hi, and Sebastian. Hi, I'm up. And Sebastian, the co-founder of Sandbox. Hello. Hello, and、uh, Piers, the head of、uh, gaming、uh, from Delphi Digital. How's it going, guys? And Pan Pan, the director of research from Chain News, and by the way, Chain News is a Crypto Tonight exclusive media partner. Great to have you all here. So, first brief introduction.、Uh, could you please tell us、uh, about who you are and what your company does, and when or how did you first get into the blockchain or NFT gaming、uh, space?、Uh, let's start with、uh, Alexander. Sure. Thanks, Yoma.、Uh, happy to be here. So my name is Alexander. I am、uh, one of the co-founders of Sky Mavis and Axie Infinity.、Uh, we basically met playing CryptoKitties and felt that NFTs were going to change the way that games were being played forever. So we founded a company where we wanted to make a very easy, friendly, fun game, and then it kind of evolved、uh, from there early on in 2018. Right now, we are pioneering play to earn and、uh, getting ready to go mainstream in 2021. So yeah, that's that's me. Nice, thank you.、Uh, next,、uh, Sebastian. Yes,、uh, uh, thank you for having me today.、Uh, I'm Sebastian Borge. I'm the CEO and co-founder of the Sandbox, as well as the president of the Blockchain Game Alliance.、Uh, the Sandbox essentially it's a gaming virtual world on the Ethereum blockchain, which enables players and creators to make their own asset, to make their own、uh, game experience, tokenize them as NFTs, and then earn and monetize for them using. NFTs and our、uh, Sun Utility Token. We've been、uh, building Sandbox for close to three years now, making us one of、uh, the pioneers in the space as well. We have launched some of the main、uh, tools of our platform, not all of them. So we've launched all the creator tools, the free editor,、uh, the marketplace where users were able to purchase part of land, lands part of our metaverse, and our game maker tool, which is like a no code, no programming required. Software where you can use your NFT to to make them come to life and play with them, and we are preparing for next year、uh, the launch、uh, of the public beta for players. We will be introducing season as well and a unique mechanism around play to earn, which which、uh, make us all very excited for 2021 to be the year of play to earn with all the project speaking with us today. Sounds very exciting. Thank you, Sebastian. Next,、um, here's uh, from uh, Delphi Digital. Hey, yeah. So、um, Delphi Digital is basically a firm that operates across different aspects of the digital asset space. We've got a sort of industry-leading research arm,、uh, consulting arm, where we work with a lot of the、uh, top projects in the space on their kind of token models, and、uh, then a venture arm where we invest in sort of the most promising projects we find.、Um, I've been in both gaming and crypto for a long time, so I've seen the role that kind of crypto played for、uh, payments, I suppose, across some of the more Sort of grey markets in video games、uh, before sort of blockchain gaming really became a thing, and then、um, since it did, I've really kind of been tracking its evolution since the first、uh, NFT projects.、Um, and yeah, I think sort of this year is the the first year where things have really started to pick up in, a, in a, an exciting and meaningful way. And、um, yeah,、um, glad glad to be here, especially with、uh, two two projects of which I'm really fond. So thanks for having me. Thank you. So、uh, next,、uh, Pam Pam. Uh, Hi, I'm my co-host tonight. <laughs> and I'm Pan from Chain News, and I've tried CryptoKitties in 2018 and、um, Decentraland this year because I like playing game. Recently, I'm playing Cyberpunk 2077, and I think this kind of an open world game is a very good angle to bring to blockchain area. And thanks. But Pan Pan, you are not playing RC or Essen Box. <laughs> 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 okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, just some quite comp- just some competition level. If you compare <laughs> us to Cyberpunk,、uh, yeah. the bar is high. But we'll let's hope you、there. ship. Let's hope you ship with less bugs than Sebastian. The pressure's on. 
<laughs> so thank you guys. So quick panel warming questions. So first question to Alexander. So what's the most exciting thing uh, that happened to Axis Infinity in the past um, three or six months? Would you like to walk us through some <laughs> numbers? Yeah. So uh, over the past, I would say six months, we've seen massive traction uh, within Axie Infinity. Uh, in terms of user growth, actually over the past year. And so we started out with about 3,000 holders of Axie tokens. And, and right now they're over 25,000. So we grew our user base about uh, eight times uh, <laughs> since the start of this year. And over the past uh, three months, we've seen exponential growth in, in terms of how many people are actually playing the game. So I think that's related to how many people are actually starting to understand what's happening here and the fact that it's pretty unreal that you can play a game and then make money at the same time while it is legit to do so. I think this has been a dream for players for many, many years, uh, but now to see this actually happening at kind of a, and still an experimental stage, but, uh, but yeah, something that, that could uh, potentially become really sustainable in the future, that's very exciting for players. And that's why we're seeing uh, an exponential growth right now. Uh, other than that, we, we also partnered with some very serious projects uh, like uh, Aave and then had our uh, IO on Binance. So it's been a hectic f past few months, but next year should be even more exciting. Nice. So, so how is your partnership with Aave? Stunning. Uh, Stunning is very cool. I, I just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Aave, so I'm very, I'm very bullish. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I like Ave uh, as well. So I, I met Stani and the Ave team several times. I think uh, last year we even had a, a meetup with them after uh, Slush. I believe maybe Sebastian was there as well. I don't recall uh, exactly, but oh, but for... Role. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but for, for that meeting, it was very nice. And that was also the beginning of uh, when we started discussing how we could partner with them. So uh, what, what that happened is that they are giving us some tokens that we can distribute uh, to our players through the play to earn system. And that's kind of one of the ways that we see that, that we can partner with, with different larger companies in the future. Mm -hmm. So what we do then is that we create a specific brand item for them inside the game. And those who are holding other tokens, they could claim that item for a limited period of time. And that has the, the that kind of does two things, right? It, it gets us connected to the other community mm -hmm. and the other community connect, connects with us because they can claim a specific item. So it's kind of a win-win for both parties. And I think that's something that we will be doing more of in the future. That sounds really cool. <laughs> Thank you, Alec. So my next question is to Sebastian. So crypto meets micro. So what excites you the most uh, while building Sandbox, especially stepping into the blockchain game uh, now? Well, what, what excited me the most is like, we've been sun building Sandbox for close to eight years now. And we had from the very beginning that vision, like we want to turn players into makers. And now for in 2020, this, this has been like a promise that we held more than ever. And we started to change lives actually, lives of people around the world who are participating in creating content supported by our foundation. So we have hundreds of artists building models, building assets that are published on a marketplace. We have 18 projects by teams, individuals and game studios around the world who are building the first game experience to be published on Sandbox platform and be available live when we'll be opening next year. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really meaningful and, and and the way that we are connecting that community, that we're experiencing growth this year has been, uh, by, uh, similarly to Alex, really exponential in the number of people who own our land, who own our sand token, mm -hmm. who are creating content and engaging through our events. We launch a learn and earn campaign. So also something really uh, I'm very attached to is like, how do we educate more and more people to the benefit of NFTs? And with that campaign, Within just a single day, we have had more than 10,000 new users join Sandbox platform and learn for the first time about NFT, start engaging with the product behind, etc. And in 2021, like we're really bullish on like how this is just going to accelerate even further. We're more and more people who are entering the space, want to play, to earn token, are joining Axie Infinity, are joining the Sandbox, more like a creator for now, but in the future potentially as players and contributors. Uh, and it's going to spark more ideas uh, around the community of developers. So they are going to experiment in new sort of interaction, whether it's around staking, whether it's around DeFi and governance. Governance is a hot topic that I think is still very under underrated at the moment. There's no real implementation of DAO that's 
very efficient and really driving project for, for many reasons, but it's still a thing that I think can grow uh, and become meaningful in 2021. Uh, and we're going to see um, new record heights. Like at the end of this year, we've seen NFT being sold for more than $3.5 million on Nifty Gateway Art Marketplace. We're seeing Axie Infinity becoming the number one uh, blockchain game with, uh, I think Alex mentioned, more than 10,000 active users and 25,000 owners. Uh, those are just small metrics for now. And next year, we'll start talking about six-figure, seven-figure metrics. Yes, 100 times. <laughs> <Ex. laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, so um, Pierce, uh, next question is to you. So what's your uh, three favorite NFT projects in gaming? Already, you got two already uh, into this panel. So probably the question for you is like, yeah. just tell us the, <laughs> the one who's not on this panel. No, I would, I would, I would honestly say, um, I think, yeah, Axie is definitely up there. Uh, I might be slightly biased in that, you know, Delphi uh, did some work with the team, but um, I do think it's one of the very interesting cases in point of uh, the power of sort of crypto economics in helping to sort of stimulate uh, engagement, growth, and, and activity. Um, the second one is uh, also uh, draws on both the Sandbox and Axie, actually. It's uh, called Yield Guild. Um, not sure how much uh, has sort of been announced around that yet, but keep an eye on that one over the next few months. Incredibly excited about that. Um, and then I'm actually pretty fond of uh, Avagotchi. I uh, love the aesthetic okay. and I love some of the mechanics that they're toying around with there. So um, yeah, excited, excited to see where all of these projects go uh, in, in, in the coming year. Actually, when I tweet about our show, there was someone also comments uh, on the on the tweet like, "Where's the Ave Gochi?" <laughs> cool. <laughs> Thank you, guys. So uh, my next question is uh, it's going to be a little bit basic because um, I am really like very newbie to the blockchain game. So uh, so the question is, so what is the so-called blockchain game's relationship um, with Ethereum or Layer Two? Or like MFT or even like Web 3.0. So uh, the question may be, uh, Alex, maybe you can um, guide us a little bit about <laughs> blockchain game. Sure. Yeah. So I think we can talk a little bit about the benefits first uh, for players and what it actually means to to have a blockchain game. Hmm. And I think there there's been a little bit of discussion around this, but but generally we tend to agree that. Uh, for a blockchain game, most of the assets should be stored uh, on the blockchain, which gives the user some clear benefits, mm -hmm. like the fact that you can Z see exactly how many of that specific item is in existence and that you can transfer them as you please. And then there are some other questions like what kind of data should be stored in this asset? Should there be IP rights, metadata rights, and different things? But there is no clear consensus on that yet. Mm -hmm. But in general, we can say that as long as uh, you can see the, the scarcity, that that's uh, transparent and it's transferable, you can then interact with a different kind of uh, asset, different kind of programs on the Ethereum ecosystem. So whether that be, for example, Uniswap for, for ERC20s uh, more than, than anything, and then you, for example, for NFT specifically, you can, you can split them up into shards. Uh, and then kind of have fractionalized ownership. So, so those are the things for when it comes to what exactly are the benefits of playing for, uh, like having it in a, in a, using a game for blockchain. Uh, but when it comes to layer twos and side chains, uh, the, the similar benefits are there, except that it's much more gas efficient. Uh, but uh, what you are sacrificing then might be some of the security in terms of the fact that you might be, um, Let's say when you are doing things on Ethereum, things are all, always pretty secure. It's maybe not immutable in a sense, but when you're doing things on a sidechain or layer two, you're sacrificing some of that to be able to do something a little bit more efficiently. And then maybe you can't interact as easily with the, with the DeFi ecosystem quite yet. So I think for layer twos and sidechains, we're going to see some massive strides over the past next years. And, and hopefully even with our uh, sidechain Ronin, you can uh, start to see some more focus on NFTs because I believe most of the, the traction for sidechains and layer two solutions have been related to, to ERC20s and specifically trading like loopring or ZK syncs or similar kind of solutions. But yeah, I'm incredibly excited to see what, what, what we can do with for NFTs as well, because the potential is massive. But only uh, use Ethereum, right? There's not so many games that be on other uh, blockchains. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I see that there is a little bit maybe on some uh, VeChain perhaps, but, but uh, Wax is also uh, somewhat uh, active. Uh, Tron used to have a little bit, but, but uh, all in all, I would say that the, 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 the majority of gaming is on Ethereum uh, right now. Maybe, maybe there we can see some changes with Flow. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. They do have CryptoKitties and they, they do have NBA Top Shot. 
Uh, but, I, but I still believe that, that uh, the real value creation will come from these aggregators, which are actually decentralized applications or games. So they can capture the users and basically the ones who have the users, they have the power to choose where they want to go. So whether that be if you want to go on Flow or Ronin or you want to do something on Tron, that would be up to the, the game creators themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a little bit of a, a shift in the mindset of some of these layer one and layer two solutions. Uh, because if the, even if, if you have a platform, but you don't have any users, do you even have anything useful at all? I mean, that's, I think the jury is still out on that. Yes, makes sense. So uh, would you like to add your comments or thoughts here, Sebastian? I, I, I am um, regarding the, uh, so around layer two, I think we are waiting to see a little bit the technology to mature before we make a choice. Uh, because that, among the compromise, one thing that's not been mentioned is like we are also adding the compromise of like the accessibility for users around uh, being able to transfer their asset and et cetera. So our blockchain, our, our architect team has not been fully convinced yet on the solution available on the market, even though they look closely at them. Maybe Ronan, maybe Flow can be a solution. I know already a lot of developers are, are announced and building projects on, on Flow, for example. Uh, MotoGP from Animoca Brands will be built there, et cetera. So, uh, but the, the real challenge is like, how long does it take to build a new game from scratch? Uh, and if we implement those side chains or make them your, even your main net for the development, uh, it's building great game always take time. And that's what we've been seeing, like between CryptoKitties and now that's been three years. And it's only after those three years that we are seeing really meaningful game going out, out of beta now and getting traction. Um, I think another thing may, maybe I like to surface is around like uh, virtual lands, really the concept of virtual real estate and, and the open metaverse. That's something that's been growing significantly this year we've seen uh, the metaverse of sandbox multiply its value by five times over the year through all the different uh, successful pre sale that we've done our unique strategy around uh, ips and brands the success uh, that we have bringing more ips and brand to adopt to be part of our metaverse but also to adopt nft as a standard so as uh, um, we are growing the awareness. We are growing the users who are going to interact with NFTs in the future through the leveraging those brands, those family-friendly brands, and uh, and this is only going to accelerate for next year. Okay, thank you. So, so for example, talking of the mainstream users, uh, how do you guys see, for example, the famous uh, gamers or like YouTuber like the uh, PewDiePie, like getting involved with blockchain gaming? I think like he was probably in a, a the D Live uh, platform, trying to live stream whatever. But do you think like people like them might be like embraced, for example, like blockchain gaming or things like that. I could jump in here. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, we've touched upon the crypto art uh, kind of niche already. Um, having seen the dramatic impact of, you know, s sort of more traditional artists coming into that space and sort of drawing in their pre-existing audiences with them, I fully expect similar dynamics to play out uh, across the game ecosystem too. Um, I think we're still probably a bit earlier in that, um, you know, even just the discussion there around layer two versus some of these alternate purpose built NFT focused blockchains, for example, I think we're still a bit earlier in the curve there. Um, but, you know, you look at someone uh, sort of influencer around the game ecosystems like uh, like Mr. Beats, Mr. Beast, for example, um, he's a sort of prime candidate for introducing some of those same dynamics, the sort of blockchain game space um and i i do think that you know 2021 could could well be the year that we see some uh, big cases in point of that wow nice um by the way and i think uh the the crew uh, a, cru a very crucial problem for the reason um, blockchain gaming is uh, a very high gas fee in the ethereum blockchain so what's your priority um to bring your game to move to or move to layer two for uh, Alexander and Sebastian. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess um, b before I answer that, I would just like to piggyback a little bit on what Pierce said in, in terms of the influencers and, and and what that actually means for, for gaming. And I think 
definitely the 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 easiest way to see it is for sure crypto art right now how, how many people are kind of paying attention to that because it's much more like it's much easier to see provenance from one influencer to the art that's being created rather than the fact that you need a functioning game and platform to actually interact with that the influencer needs to then uh, basically endorse so endorsement for a game is a pretty big deal for an influencer. If you don't mean it, you can't do it sustainably over an extended period of time and you have to be paid to do it. It's not, it's, it's not the same thing as just if you are making an art piece that's kind of created specifically for you, that means you can put your full weight behind it and it's much more powerful and genuine. And so, so having said that, going back to your, your, your question, Pan, uh, in relation to, to what kind of choices we, we are dealing with when it comes to, to layer two solutions uh, or how to scale Axie, uh, same thing as, as what Sebastian was saying, right? We did extensive amounts of research and we even deployed uh, our early uh, version of land uh, in the Loom sidechain uh, early on in, in, uh, in, in January 2019 as one of the first teams who ever did that. Uh, so we were painfully aware of the issues, and that was even before uh, the, the gas fees were getting out of hand. But, but basically what we realized is that we're so early in the space and that uh, when you are a startup and you're then building on other startups who are maybe solving another kind of problem and they're kind of just like throwing in gaming in there, it, it's very hard to actually take that serious because they can pivot at any time. And that's what happened with Loom Network. And then we were stuck uh, kind of working with, with some guys who were doing something totally different. So we have a very, uh, uh, we, we really need to find out these people who are making something that, that's truly sustainable and specifically tailor-made for our needs. And, and what we realized is that we probably know our problems better than literally anyone else in the space because it's so early. And then if you do have the technical capabilities to build that out, then it just makes sense to do it because the, the sacrifices that you have to make on the security side, they're pretty big anyway. So you might as well just kind of do it, but that's of course taking a step back and not being as decentralized as you might have initially wanted to be. So yeah, it, it's still quite early, uh, but, but uh, I think uh, over to our solution is kind of going with our own uh, solution so that we can solve the problems that we see and then eventually kind of decentralize that over time. I like, so, so I think it, it makes sense in the sense that uh, you, what you sacrifice into a decentralization, it's something that you're just pushing maybe a bit further in the user journey in your game. So once they are hooked and they transfer more easily their content, they win just like without even thinking there's a blockchain involved. And later on, when they want to trade the asset or monetize them in a different ways, they could actually engage and, and go through more complexity and more uh, gas fees of the main layer. I wanted to just bounce back on the influence topic. Like, I think if we only look at influencer um, talking about blockchain game for the use of NFT, it's not the right angle, actually. Like, I think one of the main adoption of NFT from influencer is like how influencers make themselves NFTs and use NFT as a way to engage with their community. It's like fan content, fan engagement. You produce, they, they do it in physical world, merchandising, etc. But with NFT, there's really this collectability aspect, the rarity attached to it, and the fact that potentially those NFT can be played in, in games uh, through interoperability, can be uh, interacted with in virtual worlds typically, and, and that's where really the, the leverage is and, and all the potential in my opinion. Thank you guys. Mm. Just so I, I just wanted to jump in on the end there. Yeah. Um, thinking about what Alex said as well, um, in terms of if we were to look for a parallel of how um, similar influencer dynamics might manifest in games, um, I think the current Fortnite example is actually an interesting one whereby we have an interoperability, not in the crypto sense, but of IP, right? So we have this ongoing series of, um, you know, like the, uh, the gamer famous whatever series it's called at the moment. So you've got Master Chief in there, you've got Kratos in there and people are logging in and like buying these skins so that they can, um, you know, play their favorite characters in a different world. I think an example of how we might see it, uh, manifest in the influencer or streamer realm within virtual worlds would be, it already happens, right? You have ninja skins in Fortnite, but top streamers, um, maybe someone dear to the sandbox community or the Axie communities to begin with might get a special character within the game that people could buy, you know, limited time drop. It's similar to like we're seeing on Nifty Gateway. So if you wanted to look for a parallel, that's what I think it could look like. Thank you, guys. So since you guys are all very bullish about the blockchain game in uh, 
2021. So uh, my question is, so what's the difference now, for example, from the, in two, uh, 2018 when the blockchain games first became noticed? Uh, maybe Alexander? Sure, Yama. I think uh, in general, the, the biggest difference should be understanding from, from, the, from the teams who are building in the space. Mm -hmm. And of course, there, there are some, some uh, improvements on the infrastructure side, but, but not maybe as much as we had hoped. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the fact is that when CryptoKitties kind of uh, blew open this entire industry, people started realizing that NFTs are a great way to, to store uh, some assets on, on, uh, on the blockchain, but they didn't really understand exactly what it means to, to build something inside uh, a blockchain. So what, what exactly are the true benefits? Like what is a player owned economy? Can you do some really uh, cool things to grow your game in terms of financial incentives, right? So uh, without getting too kind of uh, <laughs> bullet or kind of too detailed on that, in short, the way that you can really um, drive viral growth is if you introduce some kind of token and it's similar in the sense that yield farming is, except that you need to do it in a more gamified way. So I think that really is one of the key differences between now and then. So the first thing would be a team experience that you now have teams that have been building over several years and they really start to understand what it takes, that it's not only kind of, okay, we're going to copy the same recipe that, that traditional games did. We're going to spend a, shit, a lot of money on marketing. Maybe instead of spending all that money on marketing, you spend that money inside your game to drop tokens to your players and then you get more a loyalty from these players because they become co-owners of the player-owned economy that you are creating. I think that's kind of the real explosive thing that, that people have discovered. And we've seen the impact of that kind of very much so happen in Axie with, with even just a, a small resource like the small love potion. So, so that, that should be the, the biggest thing, like understanding and, and of course, uh, the fact that people now have more funding. The, we've seen a washing out of the weakest teams. It's been a consolidation. Now the teams that are left now they have a lot of money so that they can really put on the, like step on the gas and be aggressive and kind of uh, take this into the mainstream in, in the next few years. Thank you. So we talk about ownership and copyright. So how do you, for example, design a game where 100% of the game access will be owned by the users? Uh, this question is to Sebastian. Sebastian. You're muted, Sebastian. You're mute. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so that's essentially what I think has been the major game changer since 2018. Like we've moved from like a success that happened almost by accident, thinking only about digital collectible to like games that really take uh, seriously the consideration that we are doing it for the community. We are 100% community driven. And that means that all the content we produce at the end of the day will be 100% owned by the players. In Sandbox, uh, it, it came really naturally because of all the background of uh, the IP being in, into user-generated content. So we wanted to provide tools. We wanted to provide uh, all the underlying economic system that enables creators to mint their asset, to own their asset, to monetize their asset through games, to providing them a real utility behind, opening the gates to how uh, you are going to monetize your game creation with these assets. Uh, beyond traditional business models. That's one of the things that we'll be introducing in, in 2021. Um, and, and I think it, it really echoed with a community of artists, community of creators who uh, until today, when whether they make assets on marketplaces, Sketchfab or 3D asset marketplaces or in the video game industry, they have been the lowest paid job. They never get the value out of the content they've been creating for so many years across all those games. It's been echoing across a, a growing um, amount of players of Minecraft, Roblox, etc., where as well, like they contributed, that they only take a small portion of the revenue, if not at all, at the end of the day. So, um, and it's essential in our strategy, building a player owned economy mm -hmm. where the more players play, the more they will own sand, the more they will own land in Sandbox. Essentially, 100% of Sandbox platform within the next five years will be going into players' hands and we'll just be developing services for them. Thank you. So uh, then uh, I have a question also for Pierce. So uh, for example, you do a lot of research work. So how do you see a, a blockchain game can make a, a profound impact in the gaming industry? Yeah, um, I'd say that 
Um, I really think it does start around this sort of play to earn model. I think, um, again, the early case in point is looking at the impact it's had um, in the Philippines with Axie, right? Um, in sort of these emerging markets where uh, effectively playing these games can actually end up earning people and families sort of more income than they would from what's, you know, a, a typically a, a sort of real job. Um, and I think that uh, sort of this framing of blockchain games potentially being the kind of Trojan horse for sort of blockchain adoption globally more broadly uh, is a really interesting thought in that every single new user in this instance isn't a new crypto or blockchain user that um, would have come in for the sort of finance appeal, let's say. These are people that definitely wouldn't have had exposure to blockchain otherwise. Um, so I think that's a really important and impactful and resonant idea. Um, I think as these games scale up and projects, um, you know, like the Sandbox, like Axie and Yield Guild, basically leveraging those platforms as well, um, that will really open people's eye eyes to sort of how we can um, weave. That for decades, there has been evident demand for uh, sort of virtual labor arbitrage across game economies, right? Uh, gold farming on World of Warcraft, RuneScape, Venezuela, Pakistan, China, whatever. Those all happened despite operating in a game environment that is adversarial to those dynamics. Now we're taking that evident demand and putting it like front and center of the business model. It's a really powerful and exciting and interesting thing, especially as we're coinciding with the time in our evolution as a species with our digital infrastructure where people are increasingly working online and recognizing that as a legitimate thing to do. So I think there's a confluence of forces at play here um, that are really going to unlock some incredible stuff that will change lives in meaningful ways. And <clears throat> in doing so, you know, we've already seen a couple of headlines come out, the Coindesk article talking about COVID and Axie during the, um, in the Philippines, sorry. Um, I think as we get more of those at an increasingly large scale, it, it is bound to turn heads in the traditional game industry. Um, you know, the value propositions to the end user are clear um, from, you know, right the way through the spectrum and we're, we're all familiar with the sort of key value adds to, to users but also the way you know the sort of investable surface area for people is being dramatically expanded i think that's a really interesting aspect too um traditional traditionally in the in the, the traditional game space it's really hard to get exposure to your favorite games or sort of game ecosystems if you're lucky it's a company that focuses maybe on a single game and is publicly listed. If you're not, you might invest in something like Tencent, which has, uh, is a public company with exposure to private companies that you might deem to be whatever. But it's really clunky and not good. Um, whereas now someone comes along to Axie or the Sandbox, they can buy real estate items, characters. Not only can they buy those things, they can earn yield on them by fulfilling functions within the game. I mean, this is all like groundbreaking stuff in terms of business models of games. Um, so... Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty confident the, the impact is going to be dramatic in the coming years. It's totally changing the way we live, the way we work, the way we make money out of it. So it's, it's incredible. The way we play. Actually, <laughs> actually uh, I have uh, uh, something I just want to say uh, in terms of what, 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 what Pierce were, was mentioning. So uh, I, I have this uh, conversation quite a lot, actually, because, of course, Axie uh, has seen this, this uh, kind of the... the going from just a simple game to kind of building out a digital nation uh, and and that also includes the jobs that that are that are appearing uh, one thing that we see from the traditional gaming industry is that the, the, a common uh, thing to say is that oh this game isn't fun because it's a job but but in reality that only explains why people are for example buying a team of axes for one hundred dollars and then they can get ROI over, let's say, a month or maybe two months or something like that, and maybe even less. I mean, that's everyone can understand that because people are motivated by making money. So the, the motivation comes from the outside. But that still doesn't explain why some people are spending over $130,000 on axes. Like that motivation comes from the inside. It basically means that you're recognizing what's happening inside these ecosystems and you want to have a prestige, you want status, you want something that's like very tangible, but maybe more tangible than in real life. So for example, people who are buying Louis Vuitton bags or Rolex watches, there is no way to actually see how many of these are in existence. But in Axie and in other, in Sandbox, for example, you can specifically see how many of these are in existence, digitally verified. And that is incredibly powerful. The same thing goes for art. That's why people are spending so much money on these things because it has meaning for them. And at that point, when you can say that something has meaning, it's much more 
Like the, the emotional connection is there and it's much more than just a job or something that's not fun to play because it's money involved. This is something that that's totally going beyond gaming. It's truly a metaverse and, and something that that's just a digital nation. That's the only way I can say, explain it in a very short while. It's, it's a brand new sure. lifestyle. And, and <clears throat> there's uh, a, a, a echoing Alex and uh, one of the projects, Yield Gale Gaming, Yield Guild Gaming, sorry for my accent, also <laughs> that excites me the most is really how building a nation, building an ecosystem, having people providing scholarship and education to train more people to onboard and via this network effect to grow, to benefit. Like that's something really strong in the way like we love what we do, whether it's, we could, some people might see it as a job or fun that brings money in, but we want other people to enjoy that experience with us. And I think that's something unique that you're only experiencing within the NFT and blockchain gaming community. Like we want other to benefit from that value accrual and from the success that we're, we players, creators, uh, our, our families in Philippines, Indonesia, et cetera, are seeing. In Sandbox, we are people setting up shops and educative um, and teams to to pay other people to create, and and it, it's starting to be like in a series like this, and uh, mm. that's where it all starts accelerating. After coronavirus, uh, oh. please come to China, educate us. <laughs> <laughs> we, I, yes. I wanted to I wanted to quickly we jump did in one there. Video. Yeah. We started it, it, educating artists in China actually. Face to face. Um, <laughs> I, I, I wanted to jump in there though, Sebastian, you, you know, you use the words network effects and that's another really important aspect, um, which has kind of been touched on, but I wanted to emphasize is that um, when these environments are created in which people either through investing and earning yield on, or even just by playing um, are rewarded with meaningful ownership, um, you know, what does meaningful mean in that context? Let's talk about AXS right there, sort of actually governance token starting from Q1 2021 players will actually decide how resources are allocated from an on-chain sort of community treasury. That's amazing. That's like just, there's no equivalent dynamic before in any game ever. Um, and as I say, once people are rewarded with that meaningful ownership, the, uh, I always use the word evangelical, but that's what they are. The crazy urge to bring others in and get others excited about it because you feel like you own it. Um, that's an incredibly powerful dynamic. And we're seeing the rapid proliferation of awareness uh, about these games, literally spread by word of mouth in communities. In the Philippines, there's communities starting in, as I say, Venezuela and so on. But um, that's uh, a force to be reckoned with. And there isn't really any equivalent in the traditional game space. I mean, it sounds really, really uh, wonderful. But then, then the question is, how can we make, for example, like play to earn sustainable or even all the models that we talk about? I think this is also important, right? Um, maybe, uh, um, maybe uh, Alec, maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit. <laughs> yeah, sure. I think this is the directly related to also what Pierce was mentioning in terms of the, the access token, which actually the Delphi Digital team uh, helped design. So from the beginning, when, when we were introducing a token, we, we always wanted this to have some more, it needed to be more meaningful rather than just being a payment token of some kind. So we always knew that, that it should be connected to the revenue streams that, that were being generated within the game. Uh, and the only way that in my books that you can make something sustainable, if it's kind of the, the there's a flywheel effect where the money that, that's, being, that's being generated has to come from somewhere. And the only way that we could see that happening is if we share the revenue that's being generated within the platform with the people who are playing the game. So at that point, you can see that the revenue that's coming in is being uh, put into a treasury and then redistributed to, to the players. And, and at that point, they are being incentivized to play more. And, and that's a, it's a positive feedback loop that's constantly kind of reiterating and uh, incentivizing people to start playing and spreading the word of the game. So that's kind of the, the, the basic foundation of how the token is structured. You play the game, you spend money, and in return, you, you can earn a token, which then again gives you uh, a kind of the, the, a claim on the revenue streams as long as you are participating in the value generating, uh, like doing things that, that benefit the, the, the game in, uh, like at its core. So you still need to play and you still need to vote. If you don't do something like that, you, you won't uh, get the same amount of rewards that you should if you were kind of participating in generating value. So, players, so I think that's, that's the way you can create something that is sustainable. Yeah, so I think the players like will have a right, but also responsibilities. So responsibilities. Yes, of, yes, of course. Like if you are 
if you are only an investor or if you are only something like a rent seeker, your main goal is to extract the maximum amount of value out of any ecosystem. But that in itself is not sustainable, right? So let's, let's look at, for example, Ethereum as, as an example. Every time someone wants to interact with the broader Ethereum ecosystem, they need to pay a gas fee, right? That in itself is actually a network tax or something similar. So in essence, like when you are creating something like a metaverse or when you're creating a, a, a broader network, you need to find a way where you can extract value. And that value in the past used to go to the company behind these uh, that, that were creating these platforms. But now the value that's being extracted is going back to the people who are actually using the platforms. And that is an insanely powerful incentivization mechanism. And we will be able to leverage that into viral growth within no time. I think just by using small love potions, we've seen how effective it can be going exponential, even though it's insanely hard to get started right now. People need the private keys, they need to pay gas fees, but they're kind of jumping through all these crazy hoops just to start playing, to kind of participate in these economies. Imagine when things are easier and even more powerful. I think that's really when, when we will see the, 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 like the, the true proliferation, oh, proliferation uh, of kind of the, the, the player bases, uh, to, to, to use Pierce's words here, who is much more eloquent than me, for sure. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. So, uh, yes, uh, echoing on Alex, like yeah, in Sandbox as well, we haven't yet introduced uh, the decentralized uh, um, community DAO to manage our foundation, but we've already done something amazing. And I want to highlight it a little bit more. Like over the last year, we've sold for more than $3 million worth of land during our pre sale. And already we've put that foundation that has been supporting over 18 projects to been created and literally hundreds of, uh, of creators who have been the model. So for us, it's all about making sure that there's the right incentive for uh, kicking off uh, content creation and making sure that as we produce high quality content and we take this approach, uh, content is king on the platform, we're going to drive on the long term the value for the whole benefit of the whole platform tracking more and more users by leveling up the quality standards that we've set initially. So that, that I think is an achievement already and the decentralizing, decentralized uh, governance attached to it will be introduced progressively in ways like Alex mentioned, like you need to engage to a DAO to be significant and meaningful. You have to, people have to vote on something and what, what is it that they vote on? just launch a DAO for the sake of launching a DAO, but build the right incentive and the right mechanics in it. Uh, and, and that's something that needs some preparation around it as you build the product. So Axie has done a great job around that already. Thank you. So um, next I will, moving on, uh, Pan Pan, uh, it's your turn maybe to ask your question to our three fantastic guests. Yeah. Yeah, I want to explore more about you, know, you just mentioned the gamification or gamify because uh, these have become a popular term which combine the decentralized finance, business, and the, the gaming design philosophy to attract users maybe. So do you think this is a long-term trend and will there be other on-chain and business suitable for game? And yet, yes, yield farming better suited for games? I think... Alex, Alex first. <laughs> sure. Um, I can start like more broadly about gamification. I think it's actually a, a meme uh, that, that has been going on for too long. People are putting in all kinds of quests in ridiculous places where they don't really belong, uh, where, where it's just that people get tired of always trying to compete for some meaningless trophy. Uh, so I think gamification, if it's done correctly, it can motivate. And I think that's also where we're headed now uh, within the blockchain gaming space because you get meaningful trophies that you can bring with you that you can actually start building your digital identity uh, with. So no matter what it is that you do in life, I believe you will get some kind of badge or trophy. Like if you are, let's say, as an example, my father is running a, a, a whaling business in, in, in uh, the north of Norway. He's taking out tourists. They're watching whales. Imagine if you are watching whales and you can see, oh, you get a NFT trophy. And in that trophy, there's metadata that says, okay, we saw these whales. These are the people on the trip. And that's the maximum amount of trophies on that time. And that's, you can get that. That's more important for me 
uh, rather than just getting a meaningful, meaningless trophy for executing some, some random task when I'm working. Like that's gamification in, in, in another way. When it comes to play to earn and and more powerful for blockchain games. So uh, yield farming uh, in the traditional sense for DeFi applications, they are using liquidity as, as kind of a, to draw in people or to draw in liquidity, they are giving out high rewards. But that is not sustainable at all because you just get uh, kind of these, these uh, greedy farmers, they come in, they put in liquidity, but there is no moat that's protecting the platform connect to the platform and to the game that you're playing it's much more defensible rather than a, than a standard DeFi application which they just don't have anything they have a different name and, and that in itself is not really long-term sustainable so that's my opinion on yield farming and why i think games are better sebastian do you and do you have any comment well i think like uh, when you build a platform a platform that in the case of Sandbox is essentially focused around gaming as a use case, you, you should also think through like uh, on your model at like who are all the users are going to be involved in the platform and how do you make them interact with each other in some meaningful way. Um, and, and that's one of uh, the challenge we have. Like we don't, we don't just have gamers. Actually, we have zero gamers as of today because the game is not yet live. We have only creators, artists, a uh, game creator using our, our tools. We have landowner who might be interested to be, to be themselves creator, but not necessarily. They are, might be here for the interest of owning the virtual real estate and building businesses around it or using those to land token to actually generate uh, a constant stream of revenue over time by renting it, for example. You do have only the token holder who, who are here, who are potentially speculating and you want to involve them in other ways than just speculating with your token. You want to get them either turning into either of those profiles, etc. So you need to build mechanics that, that go beyond just models that are short term and non sustainable, like just staking for the sake of staking and receiving an API that just grow insanely and going to deplete the, the whole foundation or company reserve. And so you have to find like, okay, what if if the user stake here, what does that give in return for the benefit of the stakers, but potentially for all the other users on the platform? And rather than trophies and, and leaderboards, which, uh, as Alex mentioned, are kind of, for most of the users, unless the true computers are meaningless, we, we like to think more in terms of community goals. How do we get the whole community together to complete some goals? by simple action, whether it's going to be staking, whether it's going to be uh, purchasing lands or, or creating content, et cetera. And that's one of the mechanics that we'll be unveiling as well next year to, to support our play to earn model. Yeah. Uh, next one I want to explore about the uh, metaverse because metaverse is a virtual place which player can buy or hold digital assets or interact with each other. So what's your approach to build a thrive in metaverse and how to attract new players. And so what's your future plan? I, should I start on that one? Yeah, I can, I guess I can. Well, well, our approach at Sandbox has been differentiated because there's already some existing metaverse that can be played already. So we wanted to offer something rather unique, differentiated. So we put the accent on three things. The first one is gaming essentially. So we are not just here to, to build art galleries or social events. We wanted really to have uh, more traditional gameplay, RPG, shooter, racer, platformer, etc., where players can play either alone or with friends, compete for goals, community goals as well, uh, as we are introducing guilds and factions uh, we, and the, our upcoming season system. We wanted also to leverage our expertise in uh, working with IPs and brands. So building uh, a virtual world where the location of your land is going to matter. Uh, who is your neighbor actually matters. And if that matter, if that neighbor is not just an unknown party, but potentially a larger brand, 
that's going to come, bring fans, bring amazing content as well that you can leverage to build your own games. That's, we think, a, a strong value proposition that so far the community has been very responsive to. Uh, and ultimately, our approach with content is king and we should support 100% content production at the beginning to initiate this, um, the mechanic here and make sure that we don't just launch with an empty world with empty content, uh, players walking for kilometers or minutes without meeting any other players in the land. And at the end of the day, having a user experience that's terrible. Like after a few minutes, you enter a game, even if you're a diehard fan about, I love the potential of NFT, if you just meet no one in the game and you have no fun, it's hard to just come back every day back into it. And that's one of the main principles that's very often too much forgotten about game, like the quality of the fun and the comeback design. Yeah, I'm looking forward to your game. Uh, Actually, Alex? yeah. I think uh, the, the, there are two paths to succeeding as, as a metaverse or well, probably more actually that, that we don't know of. Uh, but but the, the way that I see it is that there, you can either build the content first or the platform first. Uh, and what I, from what I, I can uh, see is, is happening in the traditional gaming space, there, there are two main contenders here. So I view content first as uh, having a game first. So something like Fortnite where the Fortnite players, they are playing the Fortnite game, they are hanging out together. It's the same thing as World of Warcraft, for example. There is a main game, there is a main story, people are participating in it together, they are going through the motions together. People, emo more, they emotionally connect more when they are doing things together, actually, especially men when, they are, <laughs> when we are doing things in real life together even. So it's the same thing for games. And at that point, when you are connecting with someone else, that's really when uh, you want to do something more together with them. So it's a very natural thing to do for a game that is successful to turn itself into a virtual world. And that's what's happening with Fortnite, where they are, for example, going in and now creating concerts and be becoming more of a social place and platform. And that even happened with, with World of Warcraft. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have something like a user-generated content platform like Minecraft or Roblox or even, even the Sandbox. But I would say even the Sandbox is maybe more a little bit in, in the middle. Uh, but for uh, the, the, the Roblox and the Minecrafts of the world, they are very much, uh, they are very much uh, caring only about the players like that they should be creating the content. And that's a much harder approach, in my opinion, because you really need to incentivize these people to start building things inside your game. But at the end goal, that's very like, powerful when people can truly tap into all these amazing tools and really, really make something of their own. So what I think is that, that the, for Axie, the, the approach that we have is, is kind of very much content driven by ourselves first. So we want to make many games inside the Axie Infinity universe. So we have the card game, we have the breathing game, and now we are creating like a land gameplay where people can socialize with their, with their friends. They can attack other monsters. They can go on journeys together, go on missions together, and then eventually kind of want to turn that into the Axie Infinity metaverse where people can eventually make their own games using our SDK. But in a much more simple way, like much more, I would, I would say that it's not the same thing as the sandbox in general because they are much more powerful tools and that's kind of their expertise. Meanwhile, our expertise is kind of just like getting a lot of players to play our fun games and then eventually want to turn that into kind of a metaverse. So the end goal would still be the same where people can use their game characters in many, many different games. So I believe that there will be many metaverses and then eventually someone else and this is maybe where Pierce is kind of probably the strongest thinker where people are kind of, how do we connect all these universes into kind of this ready player one a game universe where, okay, I have some games from the sandbox. I have some games from Axie. I can use all these things inside a common metaverse or I'm not even sure if a metaverse is the right choice, it, it, right choice of words. It, it should be something totally different that we've never even seen before. So I, I would be curious to hear what Pierce uh, thinks about this. Yeah, um, I, I've stated it before, but I'm, uh, I'm a big believer in the metaverse, right? One ultimate one that we're all sort of working towards, um, not sort of individual projects referring to themselves as metaverses, but I do appreciate the point that within a single game ecosystem, there are multiple different sort of game environments. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, as Tim Sweeney says, he puts on the back end of his, his sort of definition for it, that uh, the, the metaverse, this concept of it um, is when we reach a stage in which people can partake in a sort of extensive virtual economy with societal impact are the words that he uses. 
And I do believe that's what all of these projects are working towards. Um, I mean, very much so in the crypto space, obviously, because the sort of core ethos of a lot of the tool sets available to us um, around the inter interoperability of assets, for example, using cryptographic tool sets to ensure kind of privacy by design systems as people do start spending you know, the majority of their time in these worlds. Um, I think uh, in terms of building within sort of crypto games, uh, projects should definitely be really sort of unafraid of using the, um, those sort of unique tools available to them. So the sort of uh, Aave Axie partnership was mentioned, that kind of um, game or player base or user base cross pollination that you can do in a really elegant manner um, is an awesome sort of organic growth hack, uh, which you just can't do anywhere else. So I definitely think, um, yeah, uh, um, yeah, taking advantage of those things makes a lot of sense, but also just jumping back quickly to um, what Alex is saying uh, around the uh, uh, sort of establishing that core gameplay loop, if you like, from which you can then begin to layer other things on top of, I, I do believe is, is the right approach for this. Um, and yeah, excited, excited to see where it all goes, really. I have a quick question yeah. for Alex. Does it mean like I can have gone dating with a virtual George Clooney in some of the exit land? <laughs> in the in the future, yes. I mean that's that's our yeah. long term goal. But I believe so more so that you need to so <laughs> so yeah, more more so in virtual yeah. worlds. <laughs> yeah, from, I mean, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but it, as, 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 as well. You, 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 might, you might have be better luck in you the like. sandbox. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, some of some of the axes are pretty ugly. I wouldn't like to see a George Clooney I, one, but um, <laughs> <laughs> you can be whoever you want in, in one of those metaverse. That that's the thing. Thank you, guys. So yeah. since, the, since the panel is called NFT Gaming, so my last question is to uh, all your guests. So what do you see for NFTs in 2021? 20, uh, uh, Sebastian, maybe? Well, I, I think I, I touched a little bit earlier on the question. Uh, I, I do see like NFTs has been used. So we've seen crypto art, we've seen uh, avatar, we've seen land, we've seen gaming asset. At the end of the day, anything can be an NFT as long as it's a digital asset. And, and in 2021, I'm, I think like it's not just about owning an item anymore, or it's not just about, uh, but it's more like how NFT turns itself into a gate to several mechanisms that enable like on, not only a, a revenue streams, but also uh, taking governance, participating and engaging into events into virtual world and games traveling or taking your identity from one of those games to another etc so to that i think where uh, nft is leading us and, and uh, i hope we can be part of that revolution um other guests do you have anything to add otherwise just very short maybe three words bullish nft gaming <laughs> <laughs> uh, alex if you wanted to jump in i'll, I'll go after you yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, to, to keep it very short, Axie Infinity will destroy faces in 2021. That, that's all I have to say. <laughs> cool. Good man. I, uh, I'm inclined to agree. Um, but uh, yeah, I think um, obviously, yeah, we've touched upon the sort of crypto art stuff. That's really blown up. I think for sort of NFTs more broadly, I, I do think that gaming is going to be one of the most interesting examples of putting these technologies in the hands of people that otherwise you wouldn't touch them. Um, as, as, I've already, as I've already mentioned. But um, I think really viewing NFTs, especially sort of on Ethereum, emerging as this kind of universal digital representation layer, I really think is uh, what we're starting to see and start to head towards. I mean, Jake from CoinFund wrote that brilliant piece on sort of why all digital content is going on chain and the concept of liquid IP and whatnot. I really think we're going to begin to see some interesting examples of it in 2021. Um, if we don't before Christmas, then uh, I definitely think on the art side, we'll breach the sort of million dollar NFT sale in a, in a single one. Um, I'd really like to see uh, more sort of, as I mentioned, Mr. Beast, I can really see him doing something with his massive audience next year um, in, the, in the sort of game space and, and the, yeah, uh, around some of that stuff. So um, yeah, excited to see what comes really. But um, I, m more Specifically to games, I, I think we will see, um, perhaps led by you know both the sandbox and Axie, much broader recognition in the traditional game space as this representing sort of optimal form of incentive alignment. I've mentioned some of the uh, sort of value add to um, users and also ways that developers can now monetize in interesting ways around that where they just couldn't before. Um, 
And also for the first time, there exists uh, a capacity for users to fight back if they're unhappy with the developer. They can now disengage in the same manner that they can engage, right? So it really keeps developers on their toes more in that, you know, if, you, if it starts moving in a direction they don't like, they can sort of just dump all their game assets or whatever. So, um, yeah, excited to see what comes. Thank you. So, Akampan, uh, do you have anything to say here? <laughs> um, also for you is bullish you're going you are going to play axie and sandbox after the pen yeah of course. <laughs> 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 cool thank you guys thank you so much so let's build a better farm uh future of gaming uh mvt gaming go 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 bullish <laughs> thank you all so thank, thank you, you. Thank, thank you very much thank you have all. a good one guys bye bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye. <laughs> bye.